The views expressed by the speakers of Cam and Plan podcast are those of the speakers only and may not reflect those of Cama, its members, or employees. Cama does not guarantee the accuracy of information provided by these speakers. Professional advisors should be consulted before implementing any options presented. Cama absolutely does not endorse or recommend any individual or organization, including the speakers. CAMA, its members, and employees do not accept liability for losses and or damages arising from errors or omissions within, reliance upon, or any use of the information provided by the speakers. Individuals are strongly encouraged by CAMA to conduct their own due diligence before making any investment choices. CAMA does not act as, nor offer the services of, an investment advisor, CPA, realtor, or attorney. If tax, legal, accounting, investment, or other similar expert assistance is required, the services of a competent professional should be sought. Hello and welcome back to The Road to Financial Freedom, everyone, a podcast that allows experts to share their stories and secrets to unlocking their financial independence. This podcast is brought to you by Camaplan, a self-directed IRA administrator in Ambler, Pennsylvania, that is focused on educating investors with different ways to grow their retirement savings faster through alternative investments. And of course, as you certainly know at this point, we are continuing to record our podcast remotely as we will probably continue to do so throughout 2020. As you know as well, I'm Jess Jones, Camaplan team member and your podcast host. Our guest this week is a founder of the Family Office Club, commercial real estate, and private equity. He has cultivated a growing network of over 2,500 registered investors, has put together family office solutions for over 100 investors, and currently has 285 clients under contract in an investment platform that is focused on providing conservative cash flowing investments. As a leader in the family office industry who has worked with many clients, our guest today has also shared his insights on fee negotiations, gross revenue royalty structured deals, due diligence, sent a millionaire investing, and how to start an office through speaking engagements, a family office through speaking engagements and publications. With Family Office Club, he helps investors by supporting direct investments that are already profitable and making money, whether in real estate or operating businesses. So without further ado, please welcome Richard Wilson to our podcast. Hi, Richard. Hey, Jessica. Thanks for having me here. Of course. Thanks so much for joining us this week. So let's jump right in. The first thing we ask all of our podcast guests that come on the show is to tell us a little bit more about your background. So that's where you were born and grew up and what you studied in school, where you went to school, um, just kind of those early things about your life and maybe some of the early things that informed you know who you became today. Yeah, sure. I'll give you the relatively concise version, not to bore your listeners. <laughs> you can ask me what you think they actually care about. But um, you know, I was born in Evanston. My dad was going to Northwestern. I grew up in Oregon and um, went to Oregon State University for my undergrad and just got kind of bored there um, and decided to graduate early and then get my MBA when I was pretty young. And luckily, my first job out of school, you know, I interviewed through the Portland, Oregon Chamber of Commerce. And most of the jobs come in from a state university, wanted to pay me $35,000 a year to work in a warehouse or something. And um, so even though I had my business degree, uh, I had to really network hard there to find a good job. But luckily, my first job was risk consulting for publicly traded companies. And I was able to earn six figures uh, within about a year and a half coming out of school. And that paid for my MBA. So I lived at home while doing my MBA at nighttime while working, you know, 60 or 70 hours a week. And then when my MBA was done, I looked around me and said, well, no one else wants to pay a 22 year old kid, you know, $100,000 a year, except for this risk consulting firm where I'd proven I could do the work, but it was boring as heck. So I said, Mm -hmm. well, can't do this anymore. So then I um, decided I wanted to work either in commercial real estate or in the field of working with investors and raising capital. And I ended up going to Boston where I met my now wife. Um, I've got three kids now, but I took a bunch of psychology courses to supplement my MBA program. And my wife uh, is an alum of, of Harvard as well and um, spent some time in Boston. And that's where I started the Family Office Club. And kind of ironically now, as you said in the intro, even though I've been running the Family Office Club for 13 years, most investors put about 25% of their capital into real estate, even if they didn't make their money there. And so now it's kind of come full circle and we have our commercial real estate.com platform, but we also work with investors as well through the Family Office Club. And um, yeah, it's been a fun, fun journey building it. 
Yeah, definitely. Well, it sounds like you have a really interesting story for sure. I think the fact that, you know, you were able to navigate your way through means of networking and figuring out, you know, and understanding also this bores me, but there are other options. I think especially being so freshly out of college, I think a lot of people probably get caught up in that idea of, oh, well, I have to do exactly what I majored in and I have to get a good salary right away. And I think you had a great, frame of mind going into that and being like, okay, well, no, there are ways around, there are ways around doing what excites me and getting what I want and getting the salary that I want. So I think that that's really cool that you were able to figure that out. Yeah. I think, um, key to some of the, I guess, turning points was, um, in college I had a, my, my website was starting to take off, um, where I was sharing some best practices on investing in family offices and I had someone tell me that instead of taking a job somewhere else in the capital markets world, that I should take the plunge and start my business, which was going to become the family office club. And it seemed like a very risky thing. And everyone around me was telling me to take the job and take the safe route. And one uh, attorney, one of my uh, older mentor kind of friends told me, hey, look, you don't have a mortgage yet. You don't have five kids like me you know, take the risk. You have something here, you have something with momentum behind it. And that was a real turning point on kind of striking out on my own and and building something of value. And the other thing that I found consistently is just by listening to clients and potential clients and what their pains are and where there's a gap in the market and then providing thought leadership and insights and interviewing experts and doing that again and again with um, published 13 books in the past 13 years and produced a lot of videos over 2000 videos and 150 live conferences. And there's a kind of a virtuous uh, cycle of just listening to clients as simple as that sounds, and then building something that serves their needs that other competitors aren't address addressing has been a real common stay in every part of our business. That's how we grow our business and kind of iterate and innovate over time. And um, we have found that to be one of our competitive edges in the marketplace. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. And so then when you say that you are constantly creating content in terms of, you know, you've written 13 books in 13 years, which is incredible. And the fact that you're always creating new video content, things like that, would you say that your clients coming to you with newer problems that maybe you haven't encountered before or new situations um, is solely how you continue to create new content like that? Or are there different resources that you look to nowadays that help you figure those things out too if you're not always being encountered by a client who comes up and tells you, hey, here's this unique situation I'm in. I think it, even if somebody doesn't want to run an association or a club or a conference themselves or write any thought leadership themselves, I think it's just really important to be part of a few different dynamic communities that are mm-hmm. always growing and discussing new ideas and structures and strategies because as an investor, if you're not constantly learning and adapting and innovating and learning from other investors' mistakes, then you have to learn a lot slower and make all of those mistakes yourself. And what I found is that in the world, there's not that many sources of information that are specifically relevant to private investors trying to source relatively conservative deals. A lot of investor clubs are angel investor clubs taking super high-risk investments on startups and the next mobile app and the next cyber this or that or crypto this or that. And um, myself and along with many other investors made our money through growing a business. And we like things that are already making money that are already have revenue. And, and so I just feel like, um, one kind of broad gap in the market is just investors knowing who to listen to, where to go to, to learn what communities to be part of. There's not a lot of choices for the investor that doesn't want to invest in startups all the time and wants to be around investor peers. And I think that, some sort of feedback system, even if you don't build your own thought leadership platform, just being part of a few communities is really key to innovating if you're an investor and just, you know, getting smarter all the time. Absolutely. I think that that's a really interesting take on it. And I think that I know for me, I'm, I'm younger, I'm newer to this whole thing. And I am inter- always interested in the fact of, you know, how do you find investments that are already well established, kind of like you said, that aren't these angel investment startups that have a little bit more risk to them. So um, I'm curious, you know, how did you first get involved then? I know you touched on it 
when you went over your um, original story, but how did you first get involved in private equity and family office solutions and how did that grow into the family office club? Can you talk a little bit more on that? Yeah, sure. So when I was in college, I did an internship raising capital for a technology company, just reaching out to angel investors. And I learned a lot while doing that. Um, I then had grown up around my dad raising over a billion dollars for hospitals and nonprofits, like a a dentist association or a community college or a university, et cetera. So I'd kind of grown up around driving him to meetings and sitting in on some of the meetings where he would be um, doing a case study for a nonprofit to a donor and the case on why they should, you know, leave $5 million to the university as an endowment gift or something like that. I then, um, while looking at where to work, figured out that the only people who were going to pay me what I was getting paid doing the boring risk consultant work was a meritocratic type system where it's eat what you kill and you get rewarded based on what you get done versus getting rewarded based on how old you are and how many lines you have on your resume or your forehead. So I basically then started the hunt to work in the capital markets world. And when I went to them, uh, they all said, well, we need someone with four to seven years experience. It was the same story I heard doing risk consulting. So I gave them the same response. I said, well, let me work for you for free until you know that I can do the work. And then if I don't, then you just let me go and you have no risk. Um, but if I can do the work, then let me start working for you one day a week or two days a week. And so I did two days a week volunteer and I did three days a week volunteer. And then they said, well, I would like you to work here full time. You know, what do you need to make for base salary? So we negotiated that. Um, and then that's how I worked my way into the industry. And the reason that I started focusing on family offices and the ultra wealthy was just that when looking around at the products I was representing, they were most appropriate for an accredited investor or ultra wealthy investor. And going to institutional investors didn't work. Uh, the clients were too small to take capital from them. But I couldn't go to someone who was not accredited either. And so I stumbled across this term family office. And my whole life, I'd been starting businesses. You know, and by the time I got out of high school, I had started four businesses and I had a business in college. I had started selling used textbooks on eBay and half.com, uh, et cetera. And so I had kind of an entrepreneurial experience behind me. And when I saw that I was trying to only focus on developing relationships with family offices at that time, and I was having a very hard time doing so because the only people who ever wrote on it were journalists for the Financial Times that never worked for a family office a day in their life. They're just writing about the trend of family offices. And at that point, there was not a single website focused on the industry. And there was no familyoffices.com or consistent blog or podcast or anything on the space. And so I just started sharing once a week and then twice a week and I started getting 50 hits a day. And every once in a while, somebody would cold call me and ask me for advice. And I'd be excited to get on the phone with them and, you know, share what I was learning. And um, essentially, once I once I saw the traffic was coming to the website, I started writing once every day. And then the website started getting a thousand hits a day and I got on the front page of the Boston Globe and got invited to speak in 15 different countries a couple hundred times. And that process just led to me learning a ton and just kind of doubling down on, you know, formalizing the family office club and just being one of the first thought leaders in the space, really. So a little bit of good luck along with entrepreneurism and um, kind of jumping at the opportunity to fill the role of sharing what I was learning with other people. Yeah. Wow. That's Really, really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's definitely, you know, more than just luck too, is I think there's definitely some of that entrepreneurial spirit. We've heard so many of our guests come on and share the fact that, you know, there's always been that little spark or that little desire to always kind of think outside the box. And I definitely see based on what you're saying, you know, you've always clearly had that. So I think that that's really, really cool to think of it, especially in the ways I, I, what really resonates with what you just said, Richard, too, is the fact that, you know, I, I came out of school in an industry that was similar, that, you know, you needed to have three to five years experience or an unpaid internship in order to get any kind of job in that industry and, and kind of being able to figure out how to make a niche in different places um, and still make money um, has kind of been a, a trial and error for me as well. But I think it, it's you know, really interesting to hear from someone as successful as you that, you know, that that this is something that just kind of came from you just pursuing new ideas, new thoughts. So 
it's really, really cool. Um, could you talk some more about, you know, what the Family Office Club does and what commercial real estate does? What are, how do these uh, companies differ and how are they the same? And who's a typical investor of each of them and what are their benefits? Yeah, sure. And I think uh, to your point before, a key to focusing on a niche area is something that has future, inevitable, bigger demand, but is not mm-hmm. yet super crowded. And in that way, no matter how long it takes to be like a top three player in that area, it's going to be worth digging in. And I didn't care if it took five years or 12 years to do very well in the niche. I knew it'd be worth something eventually, you know, and now um, we've been able to build a great business on it, you know, doing just under $5 million in revenue last year and building up investment assets as well at the same time. So just encourage those that are looking for something to think about those parameters. But um, to your question on what types of investors we work with and what our platforms do, uh, the Family Office Club has more ultra wealthy registered investors with us um, than any other community in the world. And part of the reason for that is that we don't make it hard to join. We're not charging investors $30,000 a year to get involved or anything like that. It's free to come to our events. We have full day workshops on how to start your family office or be a more effective private investor or on due diligence or on tax efficiency. We have a lot of programs uh, for investors that don't cost anything. Um, With people who are raising capital, uh, then we have membership fees, which are a monthly or an annual fee. Um, And then if an investor is speaking at one of our events, they can speak at no cost. Again, if somebody's raising capital, there's a sponsorship cost. That's the family office club. Everything for investors there is free, uh, as long as you're not also raising capital. Um, On commercialrealestate.com, what we're doing is building a community, and we just closed on buying that for about half a million dollars two months ago, and we've been negotiating the purchase of it for 12 years since October 2008. And we acquired that platform because we saw a need to grow a high-end commercial real estate community that has a slant towards commercial real estate investing And with the experience we've had building the family office club, we wanted to take that to the commercial real estate community and help people get joint venture co-GP deals done, help them source good cash flowing, consistent investments in the real estate space. And so we launched that this summer and we've hosted a couple live events with 500 people and 1200 people at the two events we've hosted So far, and every quarter, we host a commercial real estate power player summit through commercialrealestate.com. And every two weeks, we host a live event through the Family Office Club. And those live events are the workshops I talked about or an investor summit, like our next investor summit has 54 investors speaking on stage where people can learn from each other. And then the last part of the answer to your question, I apologize, the answer is so long. Oh, that's totally fine. It was a long question. (laughs) Um, the only time we really do charge anything to an investor typically is that it's free to come to our family office club events. It's free to do our workshops and get access to our books, et cetera, is, um, if an investor wants to get access to our passive investments that they could invest into through our platform, privateequity.com, there is no fee to sign up. There's no fee when you invest, there's no annual fee. The only fee that ever happens is a small profit share. And so if somebody invests, say, $100,000 and they make a $50,000 profit, when they take their $150,000 out or when they receive that profit, then our fee would be 10% of that $50,000. So it'd be a $5,000 fee only at the time when they're taking out $45,000 in profits. And importantly, we try to design this from scratch to be as aligned as possible. And so if an investor does two or three or four investments through us and one deal loses money, then our fee goes to zero across all the deals they did with us until we've made them back their money. Because we don't think that we should be able to profit off of them because one deal went well while well, they lost their shirt on another deal. And I think that's a real broken aspect of the asset management world. Everyone wants to charge a big asset management fee, whether they've made you money or not. And if you invest in three of their different funds, they're going to charge you a 2% management fee and a 20% carry. And even if one loses all of your money, they're still going to charge you all of the fees on the other funds that they offer typically. And we've just seen complaints about misalignment in the industry over the last 13 years hosting, you know, hundred plus events. So that's why we designed privateequity.com to be super aligned and not have any startups, any angel investments, 
no new fancy mobile apps or crypto blockchain offerings. It's really just stuff that's already making money, cash flowing, that um, is relatively conservative investments. And our only type of fee is a, a profit share. That's interesting. So how do you, I guess my next question that comes from that is how do you, how do you seek out or how do you find these conservative investments that are able to provide that private equity, the ones that are, you know, as you've described to me, more direct and aren't those high risk startups? And how do you, you know, mitigate that risk? How do you vet these investments? Um, Is it a process that involves a whole team or is it something that you've kind of learned over the years or is it something that your clients bring to you? I'm, I'm kind of curious about how you find these investments and how they become part of the network. Yeah, sure. So the investments we choose might not be great for everyone. Some people want very exciting venture capital, angel investor investments. Many investors who speak at our events are angel investors and they like to do really early stage stuff. That's just not me. I'm a little bit more conservative and want to see that something has crawled out of the ocean and shown it can walk on its own legs and exist in the real world before, you know, I, I put my money into it. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is I'm constantly learning a ton through our events at our event next week. Um, we have 78 speakers on stage, all sharing insights and we have 12 discussion panels and I scripted all 150 of the discussion panel questions for all of the discussion panels. And I've had to go to, uh, and I get to go to all of the conferences we've hosted over the past 13 years. So I'm constantly learning more and to prevent the event being boring to members who have been with us for a while. I try to ensure it's not boring for me by asking fresh questions and asking about a lot of things that are more leading edge. Like we did a deep dive on cost segregation a couple of weeks ago we dig, dig into different types of ways to structure a deal to make them income focused. And I'm doing a hundred tax expert interview series right now to get really sharp on taxation for my own balance sheet and my clients. And in Q1 next year, we're actually doing a tax strategies summit where the whole summit is just interviewing tax experts because with Biden coming into office, I don't think taxes are going down. They're at least stay, staying stable and he's uh, promised to try to raise them on anyone making over 400 a year. So we try to keep things timely and keep ourselves interested and to keep our clients always kind of curious and learning as well. But we do also get to cheat a little bit in terms of deal sourcing. We um, have about 45,000 different professionals interacting with my 15 person team a year. My team knows my mandate and my investors mandates and our conservative approach. And out of those 45,000 professionals a year, usually 6,500 show up in person at our live events when we can hold them in person um, or to our virtual events. We'll have 10, 15,000 a year attend those. And then out of those, we get to know people over time and the top three to five or four to 10 deals a year kind of bubble to the top in terms of their track record, the credibility, how unique they are against everyone else we're talking to, how aligned they are with what my investors are asking for. And when it comes time to actually looking at the deal, the most granular answer to your question is to look for something that checks all the boxes that I've discussed at this point, or that has the attributes where it could be a great deal, but nobody has structured it yet. So an example of that would be a dental clinic right now Um, that's doing 10 million a year in revenue, we went to the CEO and suggested a structure to him that would give investors a a very tax advantage structure and a very income focused investment return that would double their money uh, over a seven year period. And they agreed to it. And, you know, we've spent the last 11 months structuring that deal, building the relationship. And it wasn't like a pre-cooked product off of a shelf. It was us working with this company to structure a deal that would be great for our investors. And so um, that, that's that's how we source the deal flow is through hosting all of these events and having all of the, the books and the resources out there. Um, you know, we, we'll, we'll spend a million dollars a year in a typical year marketing and advertising the Family Office Club and commercialrealestate.com. And the byproduct of that is seeing a lot of deal flow. Absolutely. And it sounds like, you know, you have the ability to learn so much from this network, but that network obviously, as you've told me, you know, didn't come overnight. So another question that I do have is when it comes to choosing your people, whether it's your team or an investor comes to Family Office Club and they're newer 
to the scene or maybe the families in terms of your your clientele, maybe they've been around for a while, but they're not someone that you've met exactly yet. I, I'm curious, you know, one of the questions we do ask everybody, but to sort of frame it in a way that's more along the lines of the network that you've built, Richard, is, you know, what are some of the characteristics that you found over the years and people that you've met or successful people that you've learned from in terms of investing you know, what are some of the characteristics that make people, in your opinion, successful? And what are some of the characteristics when it comes to risk or partnering with folks, or even when it comes to working in family offices that you've seen that maybe are obstacles or that people should avoid? Right. Yeah, really good question. Um, We give a talk sometimes called Private Investor Advantage, and I do a 40-minute talk, and I talk about 18 ways to be a more effective private investor and I talk about some of the biggest, most expensive mistakes investors make. And I think that's kind of related to your question. And a few of the things that are most consistently done completely wrong by almost everybody when they first start making a million dollars a year or they first um, sell their business for one, two, three, five, ten million dollars or much, much more. We have several clients that are worth 30, 50 and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and the amount doesn't matter. It's almost always the same type of mistakes. One is they don't make it explicit. What's their objectives, their values, their goals, their priorities. Um, what's their mission? What's their ideal daily schedule and pattern look like? What is their wealth creation story and what are their strengths? And as Dan Sullivan would say, their unique abilities and their areas of true excellence that have come out of that wealth creation story and where are they passionate and want to spend time and looking at the intersection of market opportunities, competition, what potential clients or investors want with through the lens of your strengths and where you want to be spending time will greatly reduce the number of things you should be looking at or you want to look at. And when you look at what the goals are, the goals could be for your investments to move along and maybe um, be higher risk if you really need to grow your net worth more and you think that that's the way you're going to do it is through higher risk investments or the opposite. It could be that income is your goal or otherwise. So just not having any of that written down is super common and no one wants to take the time to do that, even though they'll pay their wealth advisor a hundred thousand a year. They don't want to spend two hours with their spouse over a cup of coffee, just writing this down as simple as that sounds. It's not an expensive piece of software you need. Mm -hmm. Um, the other two big mistakes, one is to just spray and pray and you go to a bunch of angel investor clubs and just, you know, say yes to 20% of the stuff you see and say yes to what you heard about at the golf club and through your brother-in-law and a startup here and a startup there. And I've had clients that made anywhere from 17 to 80 investments their first year or two after becoming liquid and having a liquidity event. And then almost all of them go to zero or hard to track or not proven, don't have traction yet. And they're just making a whole bunch of super high risk investments in a whole bunch of different industries that they don't have the expertise to step in, take over control, guide them, open doors, add to distribution, et cetera. And that's a huge common mistake, um, which leads to the third mistake that a lot of investors invest somewhat randomly without much of a plan. And they don't structure their investments like most mature family offices do, which is to break up their portfolio into three components and say, we're going to have one component, which is relatively conservative cash flowing real estate. Maybe some of it's real estate development and diversify where you do that. But the majority of it, you know, cash flowing multifamily or self storage, uh, et cetera, or single family homes. And then a second component be stock market type investments that a traditional wealth advisor would advise on and, and you know, get access to some index funds or ETFs or um, areas that will give you diversified public market exposure that are pretty relatively liquid. It's usually a, a component of a large family offices portfolio that's learned a lot. And then the third component is really investing in one or two industries maximum where you think you're going to have the most wealth creation, you can have the most control, you can drive the most value, you could be the CEO or the chairman or someone in your family could, and that would be the third bucket. And there shouldn't be the same brain overlooking all three buckets. The person who's going to be on the earnings calls and deciding what ETFs to invest in is probably not super sharp at looking at the age of a roof of a multifamily property or knowing exactly what type of financing to put on self-storage or 
knowing how to run your biotech company, if that's the space you're focused on for that third component. And a lot of families don't divide their investment portfolio into these components and look at them for how they serve different purposes. So real estate is typically sleep at night, tax efficient, hard asset is going to grow relatively consistently. And if you can be patient over 10 to 20 years, you'll probably look smart if you've made, you know, good investments on the front end um, with some diversity and where you've, you know, picked up properties Uh, that acts very different from something that you might have full control on investing in or, or building your own operating business in the third piece of the portfolio. And it's a big mistake. Uh, all three of those things are big mistakes, but you can see how they're all tied together as well. And so all of it boils down to having really high integrity between the different components. So who's on your team, what you spend your time on, what you invest in, what goes into your portfolio, um, all of those things should all be super aligned. And if they're not, you're fighting yourself and you're probably losing money, losing time and, and being frustrated with the results. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I think you touch on it right in the beginning with the idea of just as simple as having a clear plan can really make or break how you start out as an investor. And it makes a lot of sense, even as you talk about it, as the scope gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, you look at all the different components of the team or the family. So, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I'm I'm also kind of curious too. some of the, the things you bring up add some new questions to what I was, you know, what I was initially thinking is in terms of your postmaster's uh, degree in psychology, how did, or your postgraduate master's degree in psychology, how did, uh, how did that affect the way that you viewed investing and how did that tie into family investing or family office investing and family office club? And I'm just curious of how the, um, how that degree has created or inform the way that you kind of look at it or the way that you work with your clients? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that um, the degree was less important than the knowledge. I mean, I thought back then, oh man, if I go to Harvard, then I'm going to be more credible and the doors will open for me. And I learned while there that the knowledge was much more powerful than having the degree. Um, And not many people study psychology. So in my programs, I was the only business person and it was all psychologists and psychiatrists. And so that was interesting. And I really think my whole business is built off of what I learned about psychology is much more valuable than what I learned in my MBA. And I Mm -hmm. think that what I found is that Robert Cialdini has written a lot on psychology of influence and persuasion. And you can use these skills to market anything or to, build yourself um, and your own reputation or to raise capital. You could use it on any level. So I'm sure business owners listening to this or just salespeople listening to this will um, agree with some of these things that there's these scientifically proven strategies of, you know, if you give somebody value first, they're going to want to reciprocate and give you value back. Just like doing this podcast episode, if instead of just talking about, you know, how great I am and like, Oh, I did this, I did that. You should work with us. You know, this is what it costs. If instead I add a bunch of value to people, then they're more likely to pass this on to someone else and we're more like, I'm more likely to benefit. So it's almost like it's even more selfish of me to give as much value as possible because in the end, someone is going to reciprocate, whether it's camera plan or someone listening, and then there'll be another exposure opportunity on someone else's podcast or someone will want to work with me as an investor. And there is hundreds of scientifically proven influence principles you can act on. And what I found is that commitment and consistency and authority building and scarcity and reciprocation are some of the really powerful ones that Cialdini always always refers to. And the more that I provide thought leadership and insights and just kind of share the journey that we've been on, the more that I get back and I get back feedback from the market on what people value versus not. Sometimes we get radio silence back. Sometimes they get a lot of encouraging feedback and clients wanting to engage. Um, Sometimes we get case studies back when people stand up at our event saying they came to the same workshop a year before and it's changed, you know, their whole business or it's changed their life. And, and then other times it's, it's less personal type of feedback and it's just the business growing in response Um, but we get additional deal flow, the more that we position ourselves and we get additional investor connections. So for me, it's all about creating a niche position that's hyper-focused 
And then because of that focus, I'm very motivated to build up walls around that sandbox, which is the thought leadership. And examples of that would be, you know, I'm the only person that's written a book on how to start a family office. I was the first one to write a book on single family offices. Um, I bought centamillionaires.com, which means 100 million plus net worth, and wrote the first book um, just two years ago on centamillionaires. And we've worked with many $100 million net worth families before then, but also since then. And when you can provide unique information in a unique niche that's growing, then people are just attracted to do business with you because you've given them value first versus charging them money before they come into your tent to see what you have. Instead, you're saying, well, here is something that you might find helpful. And if you do find it helpful, why don't you come over here and we can have a cup of coffee and see if there's some other way of working together. And I think that as simple as that sounds, it's the opposite of how most do business when they send out postcards and a cold call or cold email and try to open up relationships without adding value first. Like most people raising capital, just cold call investors and say, hey, I just wanted to see if you want to invest in my private equity fund because I have great returns and, you know, good track record and, and, you know, people don't know if they're credible or consistent or if they're an authority or know what they're talking about. So um, it's kind of the opposite approach that most people take, I've found. And that's really been the foundation of our entire business is just adding a lot of value first. And then our prospects kind of seek us out through absorbing some of that value and then wanting to go a layer deeper, whether that's being an investor with us on privateequity.com or getting involved with the family office club, you know, in some other way. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing. I, you know, it's, it's interesting, especially because I think, you know, a lot of people sometimes forget or lose sight of the fact that people are just people at the end of the day. The word, you know, centimillionaire can be really scary just looking at it. But I think, you know, people at you, when you say just sit down for a cup of coffee, I think that really struck a chord with me just because it's like, oh yeah, like it doesn't matter how much money you're investing sometimes it's just a matter of you know working with people and providing them with that value as you said value first i think it comes down to something as simple as it's a business of people not just not just a business of money and faceless entities so i think it's really interesting richard thank you for sharing that right also i wanted to add that even if somebody is worth 100 million plus it's not like they have all the answers a lot of those people tell me they feel like they're driving through fog they don't know who to trust Everyone's trying to get their money or sell them something. They don't have too many peers in a similar situation. They don't know what processes to put into place. They don't know if they're spending too much or not enough money. They're not sure what investments are appropriate for them or what type of team they should build out. And some people think that those types of people have all the answers and everything figured out, but it's the first time they've been worth hundred million or it's the first time they've been worth $10 million. So everyone's always learning on how to manage the new plateau they're at and how to get to the next level or just get to the next level where they want to be in life, even if that's the same net worth. And there's 55,000 people globally that are worth $100 million that we know of. And I'm sure the number is underreported because if you're in Brazil or Russia, people might steal your kids from the private school or, you know, you might have to, um, you know, deal with government officials trying to get money out of you if they know how wealthy you are. So the number is much bigger than that but there are 250,000 people globally worth $30 million or more. And a lot of these things just become true once you're worth somewhere between 10 and 20 million. You start not just having a house plus some stock market investments with your wealth manager, somewhere between 10 and 20 million, almost everybody starts to invest in operating businesses, real estate properties. And once you start doing more than one or two of those things and your net worth gets closer to that 10, 15, 20 million net worth, then you really need to have some sort of a family office solution in place over time, or you're just going to be less effective, less efficient, and you know not have as good of a result. Yeah, definitely. I thank you for also bringing that up. It's the idea, you know, I initially read that word, like you said, and I'm like, wow, these people really seem to have it figured out to have, be, to have hundreds of millions of dollars. But I think you bring up a great point. People, these people are just people. They're figuring it out just like I am, just like a listener would be. So thank you for sharing that. I think that that's great for people to hear. Sure. So yeah, the, no problem. The other question I do have is, um, have you ever worked with anybody? We work with clients who, who invest using a self-directed IRA. So have you ever worked with any family offices who have self-directed IRAs or self-direction as part of their portfolio? And 
How have you had to manage that if you have? Uh, yes, I have. Um, I think that many times there's just a lack of deal flow um, available to private investors. So oftentimes their challenge has been getting enough deal flow to allocate the dollars they have in hand. And especially with a very wealthy family, they'll have maybe uh, half a million uh, to two, two to $3 million, maybe in self-directed IRA or solo 401k uh, to be allocated. And then they also have cash flow outside of those vehicles. And I think the most important thing to be careful on is just trying to find the right balance between, you know, out of the four investments somebody might do in a year, how many are highly tax efficient versus not, and where should those investments go and having the guidance to know which investment should be in your, you know, through your cash account or investment account versus uh, a self-directed IRA, uh, IRA is something that a lot of families I know are trying to get smarter on. And the good news is that 80% of investment managers I run into don't really put much effort into making things highly tax efficient. So a lot of things will be pretty good to put maybe into a self-directed IRA where it, there could be a you know tax benefit uh, to doing so versus investing from your cash account or investment account. But I guess um, making sure you have a plan for that or just understand what would be the characteristics of something that goes in one place versus another is important. And then you know knowing what it means to be a real estate professional and be designated as such in the eyes of the IRS, knowing what it means to have bonus section 179 depreciation or what a cost segregation study is and just knowing enough about the taxation side that you are classifying things correctly and not putting the wrong thing um, in the wrong side of the, the bucket there, I think is something that a lot of investors are uh, looking to become a lot more knowledgeable on as they learn about self-directed IRAs. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for sharing that as well. I think framing it, especially in the way of, of tax benefits is a way that I don't always remember to think of when I even think of self-directed IRAs is just how um, there are tax advantages to IRA accounts and things like that. And we always tell folks to, you know, consult with a tax professional or a tax provider, but some of this stuff is things that people just haven't been educated on as well. So I think that between, you know, things like Family Office Club and PrivateEquity.com or even at Canada Plan, being able to get an education on these types of investments and, you know, what are my possible risks? What risks am I running here? Um, or do I have the skills to be able to handle an investment like this, take it on and put it in a self-directed IRA and benefit from those tax benefits? Then, you know, I think that being able to have that those resources for education are certainly very important, especially for self-directed IRAs and as I'm hearing from you, you know, it, it goes all the way up to the centimillionaires. So I think that that's really interesting. Um, another question I do have is in terms of, you know, you talked about all of the different family offices that you've worked with and things that you've seen that have come up that have provided obstacles or big pitfalls people should avoid. Are there any major lessons for you personally that you learned uh, that you learned from early in the beginning. I, it seems like you have such a interesting background and you came across a lot of successes, but I'm sure that those, as you've mentioned, didn't come easy. So were there any major lessons that you learned in the beginning as an investor to go all the way back that kind of have informed the way that you look at especially risk assessment when it comes to investing? Yeah, I think related to risk investment, um, you know, trusting your gut. If for some reason you don't like somebody or you don't like a deal and you're not sure why, then just don't do the deal um, because there'll be another one you can get access to. And if you can't, then that's just a separate issue. But you shouldn't invest in something that your kind of gut is telling you to run the other direction. Um, the other thing is that I just have known so many people that have had their money burned from investing in startups. You know, it doesn't matter how good their talk is and how slick their PowerPoint, at the end of the day, you've got about 19 different risks that you don't have or you have much less of when somebody is doing half a million or a million dollars a year in revenue. You don't know if the team can work together. You don't know if the product actually works. You don't know if their salespeople can actually sell. You don't know the stick rate, the upsell rate, the cross sell rate, uh, the customer loyalty, the customer service. You don't know the, the leadership. Uh, if it's good, you don't know if they have a real culture in place. You're not sure if the CEO is really committed 
because he just started the thing. Maybe he's going to get distracted two months later by the latest craze of investments that people are chasing. And I think that a lot of these risks people miss when they haven't been a private investor long enough. And I've been burned before while, you know, investing in an ice cream shop, for example, uh, I owned a third of an ice cream business in the number one most high foot traffic mall in a major U.S. city. And it was right near one of the entrances to the mall. And the operator already had a profitable ice cream store in one other location in a less popular mall in the same city. It seemed like relatively low risk. Um, but from the beginning, there were, um, you know, warning signs of them, you know, getting the keys and signing the lease before we were able to start construction on it. So we wasted some lease money. Um, we also found that the footprint of the store was way too big. And so we were paying too much in rent for the amount of foot traffic going by. And later on, we were able to relocate to the food uh, court in a small ice cream cart that cost less rent and had more foot traffic. Um, and that, that was a painful lesson, but most painful was that because I had made the investment, but it was across the United States from me and my team's marketing and investor related skill set was not really going to help drive the amount of foot traffic inside this mall in any meaningful way. There's no way for me to step in and make that investment go better once it started to go sideways. So we're able to get some money out of that investment, but, um, you know, since then, I try to focus on things where I can add value to the investment. I understand the investment and it's not a startup and it's proven itself just to de-risk it in many unseen ways that new investors just say, well, this sounds exciting. I mean, this could be 100 times my money back or 300 times my money back, but it also could very likely be zero money back. And the savvy investor, I feel, um, that has some battle wounds and experiences, unless they just love venture capital or angel investing, the savvy investor typically learns that it's better to aim for doubles and triples than always trying to get a home run um, because you end, out, you end up striking out uh, a lot of the time when you're trying to hit home runs. And every once in a while, you'll get a home run when you're aiming for a double or a triple, but you'll get a lot less strikeouts as well. Absolutely. I think you bring up a lot of great due diligence tips, especially for newer investors and people who may not be totally familiar with what proper due diligence diligence they should conduct when choosing an investment. Are there any other you know major tips that you think of, um, especially for newer investors? And you know, as an additional question to that, are there any other tips you can provide for first time investors when it comes to negotiating? Even you know whether it's fees. I have you know in my original question, but are, you know, are there any other negotiation tips that you would recommend for newer investors? I think that if you're investing over 300,000 or $500,000, you probably have some leverage on what fees you're paying or custom designing the structure. If you're investing a million dollars, you almost for sure could negotiate the fees if it's a medium sized firm or a small firm. So I definitely keep that in mind. A lot of people mm -hmm. don't try to negotiate at all and they probably overpay in fees. Um, the other thing for first time investors is just to look at how the deal is structured. If you're being approached by a private company or a real estate company and they want a management fee and an acquisition fee and a financing fee and a performance fee, you might be better off and they might be better off saying, well, how about you don't charge me five different fees up front in every year, but I just give you a big handsome fee if the deal actually goes well, because Otherwise, they could be making money while you lose money, or you could be breaking even while they make money off of you on the fees. And really, until they have taken your money as an investor and made a profit on it for you, all they've done is tie up your money that you could have put into something else. Like anybody without a lot of training could find some boring investment or public market investment and get a little two to three or four percent return with a relatively low risk if they didn't want to try to get higher returns. And until you've done at least that, you're worse off than if you had done that. And so I think there's a long-term trend of investment managers having things be more performance-based. And I think that investors should look for those that get paid well when they do well, but get punished when they do poorly, because that aligns you with the investment firm. And if they don't have that, then I would ask for that and see if they're opening open to structuring something that's more performance-based for you. 
I think those are some great negotiation tips, Richard, especially, and I, I always look at it in terms of the way, it's not something I think of first because I'm, I have crippling any kind of interview or negotiation anxiety, I feel like, when it comes to sitting in a job interview, I, I think of it kind of like that, these, the idea that, oh, well, they need them just as much as, as you need them, uh, or they need you just as much as you need them. Um, that idea when it comes to sitting down for a job interview, even it's, it's kind of similar. It translates really easily over into investing the way that you put it in terms of, you know, understanding your strengths, understanding what you're bringing to the table, but also understanding that, you know, there's a certain performance on the other end that's required in order for your money to, to grow and to build wealth. Um, so I, I think that it's a really cool way to to kind of look at it. And I think uh, some of the ways that you've laid it out are really going to be helpful for a lot of new listeners um, and a lot of new investors as well. And looking at, well, this is what I have. This is what I want to invest. And I just don't know how to talk to people about it. So I think that's a, it's great first steps that you're providing here. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Um, I think a lot of a lot of this has been learning the hard way through investments I've made with my own money, but then also just listening to investors on stage over the last 13 years. We've had, you know, a thousand plus investors speak at our different events and share strategies at our events. And a lot of them complain about, you know, misalignment. A lot of them complain about not having good enough direct investment deal flow. And that's why they want to come to our events. And a lot of them realize over time that, just getting a smarter structure or one additional strategy in place for themselves as a private investor could make them hundreds of thousands of dollars more. And so the knowledge being transferred between peers is highly valuable and is somewhat underrated sometimes when investors get started. I think it's all about getting access to that next amazing deal that's going to blow their hair back when they're really taking outsized risk versus having a really honed in strategy that's unique to who they are. Mm -hmm, exactly. That's, that's really great and sound advice and things for people to kind of be aware of, especially as they come into this. I'm interested too, you mentioned you've learned so much from all of different, all the different speakers that you've gotten to meet and write for over the course of your years as an investor. So this year's obviously been a weird one. Uh, so what are some of the most interesting things or, you know, if you've read any interesting books this year or watch any cool, cool things on TV or a new movie that's changed the way you've thought about, you know, you mentioned current events with the election that just happened too. changed the way that you've had to think about how you present information to your uh, clients or the way that you have looked at some of your speakers and gotten information from them or uh, what are just some of the, if you could boil it down to like top three cool, interesting things that you've learned this year that you want to continue to pursue, what would they be? Yeah. So one thing is custom structuring investments with private business owners who have been going to a manufacturing company, a car wash company, a dental clinic chain, a healthcare subscription company. And with all these companies, we figure out a way to make it good for both sides, the investor and the company, better than if we had not custom structured the deal. And Many times we're able to structure a deal that turns it into an income investment for the investor. They get income out every month. And we're usually able to 1.5 to two times their money over a three to seven year period. And when needed, uh, it could be structured with an option to make it highly tax efficient. And the reason why the company is willing to do this is that what the investor is giving up is some of the long-term equity upside in return for something that's either high income and or tax efficient. So we're, we're either we're either in the middle or just finishing up structuring four different deals of that nature. And we've closed uh, on five investments um, of that nature. And that's one thing that has been kind of exciting to be working on during this time. Um, otherwise, you know, we've seen a real interest in either subscription companies, reoccurring revenue, Amazon-based companies, healthcare companies, medical spas, dental clinics, um, hard money lending or hard money lenders or people that need hard money loans. Um, and those have been some of the, the trends that we've been seeing during this time of the pandemic. And I guess the final note would just be that during the pandemic, it's been more challenging, obviously, to meet in person. And so... I think it requires even more focus, being involved in the right communities, you know, staying involved and getting that FaceTime 
um, through Zoom in with investors or partners and being super clear on what your value is to counterparties because um, otherwise you just get kind of lost in the email inbox noise and it's harder to make traction if you don't make it more personable or more you know genuinely kind of authentic or valuable to the counterparties. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think you raise a lot of excellent points and a lot of cool things to start looking toward in 2021 and going forward. I, I love the way that you pick up new things and, and look to learn new things from your network of people. So I think that's a really cool way for people to start approaching the way that they look at their own network and what they can learn from partners or people that they work with and invest with and uh, those sorts of things. So thank you, Richard. One of the questions we do ask all of our guests before we wind down at the end of this episode here is, you know, what would you say are your keys to building wealth and unlocking your financial freedom? I think we've touched on a lot of them throughout this hour, but this doesn't necessarily have to be financial. What do you think is something that has informed the way that you look at success? If you could boil it down to, you know, one or two things that really have driven you from being, you know, the Oregon State University to now, um, you know, what are some of those things that have stuck with you? Sure. I think it's, um, the number one most important thing is integrity, which means integrating everything, you know, the quality of food you eat, who you hang out with, what media you expose yourself to, who's on your team, what you invest in, uh, where you go, where you live, where you have your office, all those things being integrated towards a very specific goal. And if that goal is super specific, then you only have a few other people kind of competing with you to uh, be positioned in a very particular space in a very particular way with your unique strengths. And then it just comes down to work ethic and how bad you want to make that happen. And if you're consistent over time and you keep things highly integrated and you have the work ethic, then it's just a matter of time before others see the value of working with you because of the knowledge you've built out over that long period of time that makes you highly influential because you become an authority. They see you're consistent and committed. And then you kind of become a scarce resource in yourself because they don't know of another authority that has built up as many connections or insights or networks that are equal to what you've built up. So that's been kind of the, the key to my success. And I think that um, integrity is how I sum it up, but it's important to mention those other parts. because Otherwise people say, oh yeah, I've heard about how important integrity is and, you know, I feel like they've heard it 20 times before, but the, um, you know, that, that's kind of a couple sentences around what's kind of driven all of our success. And that's how we are determined to, you know, make commercial real estate.com and private equity.com and the family office club successful for the next 13, 14 years to come. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing all this information with us today, Richard. I know I certainly learned a lot from all the information that you gave out today. And I really think our listeners are going to as well. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate you having me here, Jessica. Take care. Absolutely. So one final question, actually, before we do go is, you know, how can people reach you? How can they get in touch? Uh, you've got a number of websites. So if you want to provide them now, uh, do you have any other websites or social medias that people can use to get in touch with you, email? Um, how can folks reach you if they want to learn more? Um, best way would be via email. It's just richard at familyoffices.com. I'm help, happy to be helpful to you. You know, we mentioned a number of our websites here. Um, if you want a free book on family offices and just to check out what we're all about, we have uh, the Family Office Podcast. We have a free book at familyoffices.com. If you are strictly raising capital, we have a free book on capital raising at uh, capitalraising.com. And then, you know, if you're a private investor and you want to work with us directly in the, the profit sharing method that we discussed earlier, that's at the privateequity.com uh, platform. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And thanks so much for taking the time today in between all the holidays and the 2020 craziness. Again, Richard, we really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks again, Jessica. Take care. Thanks. Everyone be on the lookout for more upcoming Camo Plan events featuring Richard Wilson and Family Office Club, commercialrealestate.com and privateequity.com. But until then, thank you everyone for joining us this week on the road to financial freedom. Be sure to tune in next week to hear more from our experts who have paved their roads to financial freedom, or you can call Camo Plan today to learn more about how you can start to take control of your future wealth. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you all for tuning into our podcast. We truly hope that you're enjoying your ride along the road to financial freedom so far. 
If you like what you've heard and learned, or if you want to hear more about certain topics that we may have already covered or have yet to cover, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a review. We would love to hear any feedback from you so that we may continue to make our podcast the best that it can be for you, our listeners. Thanks again, everyone. And remember, tune in next week to The Road to Financial Freedom.